Spectrum rockets had been perfected through a series of full test flights. Because of our limited resources and capacity, we had to do the bulk of the development of the rocket stages during test space flights. We planned 12 unmanned launches and we only planned manned flights for the 13th and 14th launches. The first unmanned test of the rocket took place in February 1969. Well, when the rocket left the launch pad, in those first few moments there was a sort of uplifting feeling. Yes, it's taken off. Yes, it hasn't blown up on the spot. This was already a great victory. And then, what happened next has gone down in history. There was a fire in the rocket, followed by an explosion. And it has to be said that at the time, we felt this was bound to happen. We hadn't finished working on it. A minute into the flight, the rocket exploded 40 kilometers from the launch site. Metallic debris had caught inside an engine. Of course I felt bad. Do you think you would feel good if your engine blew up with a thrust of four and a half thousand tons? You feel very bad. Controlling a rocket with 30 engines was proving very difficult. But with another 11 unmanned launches still to go before the first manned flight, the engine's control system was improved ahead of the next launch in July 1969. This is the launch now, you see. It stopped. Now it's going to fall. Seconds after takeoff, the rocket fell back onto the pad, exploding with the force of a small nuclear bomb. We hadn't left the dugout 10 kilometers away when it crashed. That's what saved us. If we had come out, we would not have survived. The rocket had been launched before the ambitious closed cycle engines had been perfected. While the debris was still being scraped up from the floor of the Kazakh desert, the race to the moon had come to an end. Just two weeks after the N1 disaster, the Americans were celebrating victory in the wake of the successful Apollo 11 mission. But the Russians didn't give up there. True to their practice of evolving the design through actual launches, the engine and rocket were steadily being improved. To prevent the intake of debris, filters were fitted to the engines, and the launch pad was rebuilt ready for the next tests in 1971 and 72. Well, this is the third launch. I've only seen this on film. I didn't actually see it in real life, only the traces. There's the fire. And their problems didn't end there. The fourth rocket also blew up. race may have been lost, but by the early 1970s the proven Russian system of refining through test flights was delivering real improvements in the rocket. A new engine, designated the NK-33, was being finalized in which the gremlins identified from the launch failures had been ironed out. With new filters and protection against vibration, the high-performing closed-cycle engines the designers had dreamed of 
were finally ready to fly. Experience showed that Kuznetsov's engines could be made reliable, but for that we needed those very four years by which we lagged behind the United States. But at the very point the NK-33 engines would be able to prove their worth, the program was cancelled. The Politburo's patience with the N1 had finally run out. In 1974, the political imperative behind the moon race had now gone. As a result, the entire N1 program was cancelled on the orders of the Kremlin, and Mishin was sacked as chief designer. What if I was unhappy? These things happen, of course. But there were a lot of reasons. I can't say that I was fine. Things were bad. But I survived. I'm still here. At Baikonur today, the desert is slowly reclaiming the colossal works of the N1 project. After the cancellation of the program, the Soviet leadership ordered the complete destruction of all the remaining N1 rockets and their engines. The entire history of the program was suppressed and the remaining M1 stripped down. At the Cosmodrome, parts of the rocket were even converted into pigsties. What does a man feel when he was responsible for the creation of a project, for nurturing it, when this system was created and it worked, and suddenly, at the height of your involvement in the creative process, you're told to cut it short, to put a stop to it. There was a disappointment that is difficult to convey now. The story of the N1 remained a shameful secret until the early 1990s when, with the fall of the Soviet Union, information started to trickle out. Visiting American rocket scientists, the first to delve into Russia's achievements in space, were starting to get details of an engine for sale. The engine used a kind of technology very different to what the Americans were familiar with. description to me was was I think there's something there go find out so off we go to to start developing contacts you know who do you talk to how do you get there you know that the barriers that we were looking at looked to be uh, almost insurmountable at the time but we you know we chewed away at it finally got got the right connections and started seeing some of the data information was emerging about an engine with unusually high performance specifications. When we went to Moscow, the word got around that we were there. And we went, you know, several times. And what happened is people started coming to our hotel. And one of the people that came was a, was a gentleman from a test facility in Salda, up in Siberia, where they had tested the NK-33 engine. And through him, uh, we were able to arrange a meeting with, with Mr. Kuznetsov himself. An unprecedented invitation followed to visit the design bureau at its secret location in Samara. There was something they wanted the Aerojet visitors to see. of engines. There were over 60 engines stored in this one area, just side by side. To see that kind of uh, quantity of this tremendous asset was absolutely incredible. 